you're listening to the Divorce in Your Money show, the number one podcast that discusses the complex business of divorce. I'm your host, Sean Lehman, MBA and certified divorce financial analyst. You can visit us at divorceandyourmoney.com. In this episode, I want to talk to you about spousal support, and spousal support comes by many names. Sometimes it's called alimony or maintenance or something like that, and it always generally means the same thing. Now, some states, I have to warn you, have different terminology for different, not only types of support, but sometimes there's words that sound like spousal support or or alimony, but aren't exactly what I'm talking about. So sometimes you need to, well, all the time, you need to check exactly the word that your state uses. Because even though the principles, as I say on this show, apply to you wherever you are, States have their own way they interpret laws and write the laws that can affect you differently. And we first talked about spousal support in episode 12. So go back and listen to episode 12 because I give you a lot of good information that you need to know about spousal support there. But I want to provide some updated information. It's a very important topic that I haven't talked about in a while. And, you know, if you were to look at a very high level, When it comes to divorce, divorce boils down basically to three things. Dividing property, spousal and child support, and then the third thing is custody. Now, I talk a lot about property and support. I I won't talk too much about custody here on the show in general. Sometimes we will have experts come in to talk about it. But when you think about spousal support, it's always a very contentious area. Because it means that one spouse is paying money to another spouse and potentially for a long time. And this is after the divorce is over in most cases. At the same time, if you're the spouse receiving support, you probably need it. It's essential for you to live on and to get back on your feet and to help you recover and live a semi-normal life after the divorce. And because the person paying tends to resent the payments, but at the same time, the person who needs it needs that money. It can just cause a very strong clash between couples and former spouses. And it's a very tough issue to deal with. I hear a lot of emotions on either side when it comes to spousal support. Now, there's a lot I could talk about when it comes to spousal support, but let's start with just a basic definition to make sure that we're all on the same page. What do I mean by spousal support or alimony or maintenance? Well, it is money paid to a spouse following the divorce. Now, there is a form of support called temporary support, which if you listen to episode 12, I talk about, but temporary support oftentimes occurs while you're separated or or while you're just still figuring out the divorce and how it's going to proceed. Now, the reason that spousal support exists, you know, there's a reason for it, and that is is that not all the time, not in every couple, do both spouses work. And for any variety of reasons, one spouse might work and the other might not, or work substantially less. And so in order to level the playing field a bit, because you could end up in a situation where one spouse who wasn't working, well, if they end up in a situation, they get divorced, and all of a sudden they're without income and without, you know, good job prospects, they just kind of be out left in the dust trying to struggle and, and survive. And so spousal support exists to level the playing field a bit, to make sure that both spouses, even though their lifestyle may change, they will hopefully not be out on the street after divorce, which, believe it or not, it did happen at once upon a time. And spousal support is there to prevent that from happening. Now, spousal support varies widely in many ways, some you might not think about. Not only does every state have a different way that they calculate spousal support. Some states have very generous spousal support guidelines. Other states have what one might call stingy spousal support guidelines in that they don't give you much support at all, and you shouldn't expect much. On top of that, some states, the spousal support calculation is literally a formula. It says, here are the inputs, 
And here's how much one spouse should be paying to the other. Other states, it's completely open to interpretation. You can pretty much arrive at almost any number you want to. And on top of that is sometimes a judge is going to decide and the judge is going to reply or decide on factors that matter to him or her that day. And so even though you're in the same state, you could have two different judges with two completely different awards for spousal support looking at the same set of facts. And so the point is, is that there's not a hard and fast rule almost anywhere. And it's subject to a lot of negotiation and discussion, which makes it that much harder. That said, there are some key criteria that almost every state takes into account. Things that you should be thinking about. And here's what they are. There's length of the marriage, how long you were married, income for both spouses, your standard of living, if one spouse maybe gave up a career to raise the children, and the earning capacity of the spouses. Now, One of the things that's really important for people to consider, particularly when you think about the big picture in divorce, when you think about all the issues that are going on and and financial issues, this is one issue that in the coaching sessions I want to make sure that we focus on, and that's the length of time that support is being paid or received. Because sometimes you could end up in a situation where you're paying spousal support and for just a few years, maybe just a year, maybe three years, or or maybe five years. But other times, there's still places where you could be receiving it or paying it for life. I know that sounds crazy, but it is the case in many places, and there's reasons for that. You know, for instance, A state like Texas, Texas is actually on the more restrictive side of spousal support. So if we were planning and working together, you wouldn't expect 20 years of spousal support. Texas is pretty strong language in that regard. But if you're in a state like California or New York, they have two different, completely separate methods for determining spousal support or alimony. New York uses an approximate formula. California has just another set of rules that do allow the possibility of lifetime alimony. So it really depends upon where you are. And also, as I said, it depends on your individual circumstances. So just know that even if there is a law, you can still have the possibility, not going to say that this is going to be the case in the actual result, but there is a possibility to negotiate more generous spousal support or less generous spousal support, depending upon your situation and what you need. So something to think about. The other thing I want to bring up, and this was one of the most popular episodes, and I haven't talked about it in a while, is can you change spousal support later? So one of two situations, of course. You have to look at both sides, because I work with spouses on both sides. One spouse who's receiving support, and the other spouse who might be paying support. Now, if you're paying support, it is possible to change spousal support. And ultimately, life happens. And what I mean is, sometimes you get a better job, sometimes you lose your job, sometimes you get disabled or something happens, or just something in life happens and your circumstances change. Well, if it does, it's a good grounds to potentially change spousal support. Some of the things are illness, health, cohabitation, or remarriage. So if one spouse gets remarried, meaning if you are receiving support and you get remarried, or in some cases, depending upon how it's worded, if you start living with someone else, then that is a case that you could be changing the spousal support. Also the same as if there is a change in custody. Maybe one spouse starts taking over custody issues that can have an effect on actually the spousal support, not child support, but spousal support as well. And there's if one spouse retires. So there's a lot of different variables is the point and a lot of different things that you need to be thinking about. And yes, it can be modified, but because it can be modified doesn't mean that changing it is easy. It could mean you're reopening old wounds and having to start a fight yet again with your ex-spouse. 
It could mean that you're going to be engaging lawyers again and spending a lot of money trying to change the spousal support and fighting it out. And on top of that is it really needs to be a compelling reason and worth the fight and worth the change for you to pursue that option. And there's no guarantee. That's the end of the day. So even if you have a strong case and you say it needs to be changed for this reason or that reason, and you have the evidence and the proof, it's still not a guarantee that you'll be successful in trying to change the support that is awarded. So when you're negotiating and thinking about spousal support, you have to keep in mind that what you're agreeing to, although it can be changed, you need to understand and accept that what you're agreeing to might not change for a while if you're the person paying. If you're the person receiving, you got to make sure that whatever you're receiving is within your budget. You know, people call me all the time and they say, hey, is this enough money? Like, what do I need to live? And if you're not getting enough support to maintain certain aspects of your life or keep up with the rent payment or the mortgage payment or whatever it is, and you don't have other prospects on the other side for income, well, that could lead you into a world of trouble. Now, on the other side, I'm just going to make this comment is that child support is always modifiable. And I don't want to say it's easier to modify, but there's more circumstances in which you can modify child support. But, you know, just something to think about as you think about support in general. But spousal support is a trickier issue in many ways. And the last thing I want to discuss when it comes to spousal support and updating some of the information on spousal support is that you always have to remember that spousal support is taxable income to the person who's receiving it and tax deductible to the person who is paying it. That means if your ex-spouse is paying you spousal support, you have to report that income to the tax authorities as income. I have cases where that amount is very large. Now, if you're the one paying spousal support, you, have, you can deduct that from your income, which means you get a tax benefit is the short version if you're the person paying. There's interesting advanced tips that come with spousal support depending upon if you're paying or if you're receiving Particularly if you're receiving, there's some tax tricks that a lot of accountants don't even know, I found out. Even some really good accountants that allow you to do some interesting things with retirement savings using spousal support. Now, it's a complex subject I'm not going to get in today, but something that you should think about and keep in the back of your mind if you're the person receiving spousal support. Now, As I said, the person paying support, those payments are tax deductible. The person receiving support, those payments are taxed as income. There is a difference between spousal support and child support when it comes to taxes. Child support is neither taxable nor tax deductible, which means if you're discussing child support, you do not get to deduct the child support payments from your taxes if you're the person paying. If you're receiving child support, you don't have to call that income. It is a separate thing for tax purposes. So let's wrap this up. As you can tell, spousal support is very complicated and it really varies depending upon your individual circumstances. Unless you have a state that says, here's the exact statute, you input this information, and here comes the outcome. Unless you're in one of those states, and there's a handful of them, otherwise it's going to be a potential area for negotiation. And so I just want to make sure you're prepared and you're thinking about all of the things involved with every financial decision. I want you also to think, particularly when it comes to something like support, is you need to think for the long term. Is So you need to understand how does that support not only affect you, that spousal support, for the next year, but how is your life going to look five years or ten years down the line? I even have a client right now that I work with extensively who is getting spousal support for about a a, a ten-year period in this particular state. And after three years, we're at the three-year mark, And spousal support changes substantially three and a half years in. And then four and a half years in, it was structured, so it declines again. 
And then seven years in, something else happens. But we are planning for those things far in advance. And you have to think about those things because even though three years or five years sounds like a long time now, it will be on you uh, a lot sooner than you think. And so I just want to make sure that you understand this information. You're thinking about the possibilities and the potential pitfalls. And spousal support is, is a very important area. So find out your local rules, ask your attorney what to expect, and make sure that you're making the right decision for you. We're almost done with the episode, but don't leave quite yet. Before you go, I want to make sure that you get the help you deserve. All you have to do is go to divorceandyourmoney.com, and the first thing that you do when you get there is sign up for the email list. You'll see a little box that says, get updates and tips, and I will send you exclusive articles, content, and information that you will not find anywhere else, and it gets to go directly to you. The second thing that you do is consider getting one-on-one financial coaching. Look, divorce attorneys are good, but attorneys are not financial experts, and they can make many financial mistakes. I mean, even in the last episode, did they explain these details to you? Did they even bring them up, consider them? And I understand, because finances are really, really complicated. That's why there's over 100 episodes explaining different financial concepts. And sometimes you get to the point where the general information in the podcast, while helpful, you have the question is, how does it apply to me? How does it apply to my situation, my life, and my divorce? And the only way to find out is to go for the one-on-one coaching sessions where I get to help you across the United States whether you're in your California, Texas, Ohio, Illinois, Florida, New York, everywhere in between. We work by phone, email, and in person. All you have to do is click on the coaching tab and fill out a few short questions, and we'll set up an introductory call to see if I can help you. The sooner you get started, the better. Even if you're still preparing financial information or waiting on your spouse to prepare financial information, we can help with that. Or if you're in the middle of negotiating and trying to decide what's right for you. But here's the deal is once you've signed on the dotted line, you know, the mistakes today are pretty much permanent. And I don't want you to make costly mistakes during divorce. So be sure to consider the coaching and the sooner you get started, the better off you will be. Finally, on divorceandyourmoney.com, there's just a ton of great resources on there. You can subscribe to the podcast, and if you have iTunes, leave a review, which helps other people discover this free information. I'm your host, Sean Lehman, MBA and Certified Divorce Financial Analyst. Thank you for listening. 